before we start, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Stuart Scott. I'm one of the trainers here at Cloud Academy, specializing in AWS. With the continuing growth of microservices and the cloud best practice of designing decoupled systems, it's imperative that developers have the ability to utilize a service or system that handles the delivery of messages between components. And this is where SQS comes in. SQS is a fully managed service offered by AWS that works seamlessly with serverless systems, microservices, and any distributed architecture. Although it's simply a queuing service for messages between components, it does much more than that. It has the capability of sending, storing, and receiving these messages at scale without dropping message data, as well as utilizing different queue types depending on requirements, and includes additional features such as dead letter queues. It is also possible to configure the service using the AWS Management Console, the AWS CLI, or using the AWS SDKs. Let me focus on some of the components to allow you to understand how the service is put together. The service itself uses three different elements, two of which are a part of your distributed system, these being the producers and the consumers, and the third part is the actual queue, which is managed by SQS and is managed across a number of SQS servers for resiliency. Let me explain how these components work together. The producer component of your architecture is responsible for sending messages to your queue. At this point, the SQS service stores the message across a number of SQS servers for resiliency within the specified queue. This ensures that the message remains in the queue should a failure occur with one of the SQS servers. Consumers are responsible for processing the messages within your queue. As a result, when the consumer element of your architecture is ready to process a message from the queue, the message is retrieved and is then marked as being processed by activating the visibility timeout on the message. This timeout ensures that the same message will not be read and processed by another consumer. When the message has been processed, the consumer then deletes the message from the queue. Before moving on, I just want to point out a little more relation to the visibility timeout. As I said, when a message is retrieved by a consumer, the visibility timeout is started. The default time is 30 seconds, but it can be set up to as long as 12 hours. During this period, the consumer processes the message. If it fails to process a message, perhaps due to a communication error, the consumer will not send a delete message request back to SQS. As a result, if the visibility timeout expires and it doesn't receive the request to delete the message, the message will become available again in the queue for other consumers to process. This message will then appear as a new message to the queue. The value of your visibility timeout should be longer than it takes for your consumers to process your messages. I mentioned earlier that there are different types of queues, these being standard queues, first in first out queues, and dead letter queues. Standard queues, which are the default queue type upon configuration, support at least once delivery of messages. This means that the message might actually be delivered to the queue more than once, which is largely down to the highly distributed volume of SQS servers, which would make the message appear out of its original order of delivery. As a result, the standard queue will only offer a best effort on trying to preserve the message ordering from when the message are sent by the producers. Standard queues also offer an almost unlimited number of transactions per second, TPS, making this queue highly scalable. If message ordering is critical to your solution, then standard queues might not be the right choice for you. Instead, you would need to use first in, first out queues. This queue is able to ensure the order of messages is maintained and that there are no duplication of messages within the queue. Unlike standard queues, FIFO queues do have a limited number of transactions per second. These are defaulted to 300 per second for all send and receive and delete operations. If you use batching with SQS, then this changes to 3000. Batching essentially allows you to perform actions against 10 messages at once within a single action. So the key takeaways between the two queues are, for standard queues, you have unlimited throughput, at least once delivery, and best effort ordering. And for first in first out queues, you have high throughput, first in first out delivery, and exactly once processing. For both queues, it is also possible to enable encryption using server-side encryption via KMS. A dead letter queue 
differs to the standard and FIFO queues, as this dead letter queue is not used as a source queue to hold messages submitted by producers. Instead, the dead letter queue is used by the source queue to send messages that fail processing for one reason or another. This could be the result of code within your application, corruption within the message, or simply missing information within a database that the message data relates to. Either way, if the message can't be processed by a consumer after a maximum number of tries specified, the queue will send the message to a dead letter queue. This allows engineers to assess why the message failed, to identify where the issue is, to help prevent further messages from falling into the dead letter queue. By viewing and analyzing the content of these messages, it might be possible to identify the problem and ascertain if the issue exists from the producer or consumer perspective. A couple of points to make with a dead letter queue is that it must be configured as the same queue type as the source it's used against. For example, if the source queue is a standard queue, the dead letter queue must also be a standard queue type. And similarly, for FIFO queues, the dead letter queue must also be configured as a FIFO queue. The simple notification service is used as a publish and subscribe messaging service. But what does this mean? SNS is centered around topics, and you can think of a topic as a group for collecting messages. Users or endpoints can then subscribe to this topic, and messages or events are then published to that particular topic. When a message is published, all subscribers to that topic receive a notification of that message. This helps to implement event-driven architectures within a decoupled environment. Again, much like SQS, SNS is a managed service and highly scalable, allowing you to distribute messages automatically to all subscribers across your environment, including mobile devices. It can be configured with the AWS Management Console, the CLI, or the AWS SDK. As mentioned, SNS uses the concept of publishers and subscribers which can also be classed as consumers and producers, and works on the same principle as SQS from this perspective. The producers, or publishers, send messages to a topic, which is used as a central communication control point. Consumers, or subscribers of the topic, are then notified of this message by one of the following methods. HTTP, HTTPS, email, email JSON, Amazon SQS, application, AWS Lambda, or SMS. Subscribers don't just have to be users. For example, it could be a web server and they may be notified of the message via the HTTP protocol. Or if it was a user, you could use the email notification method and enter their email address. SNS offers methods of controlling specific access to your topics through a topic policy. For example, you might want to restrict which protocol subscribers can use such as SMS or HTTPS, or only allow access to this topic for a specific user. The policy themselves follow the same format as IAM policies. For more information on IAM policies, please see our existing IAM course, which is available within our library of content. Much like SQS, SNS also integrates well with AWS Lambda, a key serverless compute service. To learn more about serverless technologies, you can view our existing learning path entitled Serverless Computing on AWS for Developers, which can be found here. This integration allows SNS notifications to invoke existing Lambda functions. Like SQS, the Lambda function has to be subscribed to the topic. Then when a message is sent to the topic, the message is pushed out to the Lambda function to invoke it. The function itself uses the payload of the message as an input parameter where it can then alter the message if required or forward the message onto another AWS service or indeed to another SNS topic. To configure AWS Lambda to work with the topic, you can perform the following steps. From within the SNS dashboard of the AWS Management Console, select Topics. Select the topic that you want to subscribe to with the Lambda function, select Actions and subscribe to Topic. Using the protocol menu, select the AWS Lambda option. Then you must select the Lambda function to be used from the endpoint drop-down box. Finally, you can select the version or alias of the function, and to select the latest version of the function, choose the latest option. Select Create Subscription. 
To gain more insight into this process and to see an example of how this can be used to create a sample message history store using SNS, Lambda and Amazon DynamoDB, you can view this blog post made by AWS found here. We also have a lab which will teach you how to process SNS notifications with a Lambda function. As a simple example, the lab uses Python to log custom metrics to CloudWatch based on the message payload. The SES service makes it possible to use AWS infrastructure and email servers to handle an automated email system to communicate with your customers. This makes it a good choice for marketers and developers. For example, you could use SES to send a confirmation email to customers, notifying them of their new account details that they may have just set up on your website, or an email confirmation sent to a customer detailing their online order placed via your site. When receiving email, you can architect your applications to respond automatically to incoming emails, such as requests to unsubscribe to your newsletter, or develop applications to receive incoming email from customers and automatically create tickets that can be assigned to your team to resolve their issues. As expected, it's a very reliable and cost-effective service that ensures you are able to maintain a good communication channel to your customers and third parties. This service is easily able to integrate into your existing systems such as your SMTP interfaces or existing applications using the AWS SDKs. To move onto a larger and wider scale distribution of emails, you can request to be moved out of the sandbox environment by opening a ticket within the AWS Support Center to increase the limits for SES sending. More information on this process can be found using the following link. Once out of the sandbox environment, you can also start to monitor your sending activity, including the number of bounced emails or complaint emails. Also, you are able to verify entire domains rather than individual email accounts. As a part of the managed service offering of SES, when you receive emails via SES, AWS will automatically scan for spam and viruses and reject any messages from untrusted sources. When receiving email, there are two ways to configure SES to instruct it as to what to do with the email. These being recipient-based control and IP address-based control. Both of these methods can work together to direct SES as to where to send the email and if it should be accepted. With recipient-based control, you set up configurations to direct the email based on the recipient. These recipient lists are classed as conditions. Receipt rules are used to control what action is taken when a condition is met, so when the recipient of the email matches a recipient in the condition list. When a match is found, the recipient rule will carry out the associated action for that particular rule. If no match is found, then the email is deleted. The actions that are available to these rules are as follows. The S3 action. The email will be delivered to a nominated S3 bucket and if required, SNS can also be used to add a notification on when this delivery occurs. SNS action. The email will be published to an SNS topic where all subscribers of the topic will receive a copy of the entire email message. Lambda action. This incoming email will result in calling a Lambda function. Again, SNS can be used to notify you when this event occurs. Bounce action. This simply rejects incoming email and returns a bounce response to the sender of the email. SNS can again be used to manage notification of this event. Stop action. This will stop the evaluation of the receipt rule set. Add header action. This will simply add a header to the email. And finally, the work mail action. This action will use Amazon work mail to process the email. So as an example, if you had a condition listed, stuart.scott at cloudacademy.com, with the action of Amazon S3, and SES received an email addressed to stuart.scott at cloudacademy.com, the receipt rule set would be analyzed until the condition was met, which is my email address. At this point, SES would analyze the required action, which would be to store the email on Amazon S3 and send a notification that this action has happened via SNS, if configured to do so. IP address based control defines what happens to your email based on its source IP address. This method allows you to select if email should be accepted or rejected based on its originating IP address. 
through the use of different lists, which relates to allow or block emails, it can help you prevent SES from delivering emails from unwanted sources, but allowing mails from known and trusted sources. Behind the scenes of SES, the service maintains, operates and updates its own list of known spamming sources to help reduce the amount of unwanted emails delivered. One point to mention here is that by default, all email that originates from EC2 instances is blocked. As a result, you must add them to your allow list if this is a requirement. With both of these processes in place, the incoming flow of email to SES is as follows. IP address based control is applied first to identify if the email should be allowed or blocked based on the configured lists. If the email is allowed, SES reviews your receipt rule set to identify a match within the conditions. If no conditions are met, the email is dropped at this point. If a match is found, SES will carry out the action based on the matching rule. Now we have a clear understanding of what is required, let's get started with the training.